there is something awesome about Easter that is invisible in jelly beans and Easter eggs. Absolutely can't see it in a chocolate Easter bunny. And it is the miracle of how God transforms our deepest pains, our most evil losses, into a complete victory in Christ and the resurrection, which is why we celebrate Easter. Easter is not about jelly beans or Easter eggs or chocolate bunnies. We, as sinful human beings, have a tendency to take that which is painful and ignore it and focus on something fun. I'll give you just a concrete example, and it's absolutely simple. You don't even have to raise your hand because I know how you're going to choose. If you were given a choice of attending a funeral or going to Disneyland, which would you choose? It's it's a no-brainer. I mean, obviously. We'd all choose to go to Disneyland for the fun. Who wants to go to a funeral and cry and grieve and, and feel the pain of the loss, right? Even if it's not somebody who was close to you that died, if you just go there, you're going to be touched by the grief. And, oh, man, who wants that, right? Well, I want to invite you to open up to Luke. Open the gospel to Luke. Luke 19, we're going to read one verse, verse 41. And we're going to see something unique about Easter that is invisible in chocolate bunnies or jelly beans or Easter baskets. You absolutely won't see it there because that's focusing on the fun. We want to jump from here to the resurrection and bypass the pain. It's our human nature. God does not do that. God does not ignore or run away from our pain. So when you look at 19 in, chapter, in, in Luke, the gospel, chapter 19, we're going to look at verse 41. And we're going to see some unique reality here. Let me paint the picture. This is Jesus on the way to Jerusalem. And he's entering Jerusalem. And he's ridden the colt, which is signifying it's a prophetic sign that he's the Messiah. He's riding the colt into the city. And the city's cheering. It's a parade. And people are saluting and waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna. And they're screaming at the top of their lungs, their Savior's here. It's a big deal. Everybody in the city is aware of what's going on. Now, we think that's a victory, right? In human terms, a parade is like winning the World Series. Yeah, let's bring out the trophy and take our pictures, right? Jesus stops the crowd now. He's entering Jerusalem. He stops the crowd. And this is what happens in verse 41. And when he approached... He saw the city, and he wept over it. When you are leaving Bethany, and you're going to Jerusalem, it's a short distance, but you have to go through a valley. So you go from the top of the Mount of Olives, down the valley, and then back up to the gate to enter the city of Jerusalem. And and on the other side of the city wall, as you're on on the mountain, the Mount of Olives, and you're looking over the valley and into Jerusalem, the first thing you see, the... The city center is the Temple Mount, and you see the temple. And it's it's glorious. It's gleaming white stone. So as you're standing on the Mount of Olives, you're looking across. You see the main eastern gate. You see the temple, and it's just awe-inspiring. And Jesus is standing there. He's with the crowd. He's on the colt. He's entering into Jerusalem, and he stops, and he weeps over the city. Now, you and I hear the term city, and we think, okay, that's the buildings. No, it's the people. And you know this, because what is a city without people? There's a name for that. It's called a ruin. It's not a city anymore. So the buildings don't make the city, the people do. And Jesus stops and he weeps over the people. Why is he weeping over the people? They're clapping and waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna, and they're cheering him on. It's a parade, right? No. He knows their hearts. He knows what they're about to do. He knows what they're going to do. He knows what's going to happen in 30 years, 40 years. He knows. These people that are cheering him today are tomorrow going to be shouting, crucify him. 
they're going to reject their Messiah. They're going to reject God. Jesus is God, and they're going to reject him. And they're going to turn him over to the Romans for crucifixion. And it gets worse. You, you wouldn't think it could get worse. In just a few decades, they're going to rebel against God further and try to reclaim their capital for themselves and their nation for themselves. And they're going to rebel against Rome. And Rome's going to come and destroy every tree, every blade of grass, every building. Rome is going to burn Jerusalem to rubble and literally push the stones off the mountaintop where the temple is so there's nothing there. And they're going to sow salt in the earth so nothing will grow. When Rome goes to destroy a city, there is nothing left. And that's what Rome's going to do. They're going to come in and literally kill every living being, every dog, every cat, every baby, every woman, every girl, everybody's going to be killed. And then it's going to be burnt to the ground. And the rocks will be pushed off the top. As a matter of fact, you can go to Jerusalem today and still see piles of the rocks from the ruined, burnt temple, the broken temple. There's still piles of rocks at the bottom that they haven't done anything with. They're still there today. Jesus is weeping over their coming destruction. God takes our pains seriously. This is not a light topic for God. This is not cheerful. And you know, I love preaching cheerful messages and cheering you up in Christ and getting you excited about your life in Christ. And, and in order to do that, we've got to deal with reality. And, and reality is there is pain in life. There is grief in life. There is death. There is loss. There is sin. And we need to deal with it. Jesus came to deal with it. He came to weep over it. He didn't stand there at the, at the city gates and go, Okay, your Messiah's here. Everybody bow down and worship me. He didn't do that. Because he knew for us to enter into heaven with him, the penalty for our sin had to be paid. God has wept over not only Jerusalem, but God has wept over from the very beginning our sin. Do you realize that? Let's look at some examples going back to Genesis. God grieves. In Genesis 6, 6, God was grieved in his heart over the wickedness of men. In Isaiah 54, verse 6, like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit is God. In Isaiah 63, verse 10, they, the people of God, rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. We can grieve God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. God grieves our sin. In Psalm 78, verse 40, often they, the people of God, rebelled and grieved him. When it, the Word of God talks about the people of God, you can put your name there. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're a member of the people of God. And often we think of they, Israel, as, well, that was them. I'm not like that. Really? You think you're different? You never sin? You never grumble and complain? The people of Israel grumbled and complained all the time. They rebelled all the time. They wanted their way all the time. That kind of sounds like me. How about you? So God grieved over their sin. God grieves over our sin. And Ezekiel... Chapter 6, verse 9, God said, How I have been hurt by their adulterous hearts. Not just their actions, but their hearts. Their hearts were always unfaithful to God. And I think ours are too. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit is literally a command given to God's people, to the church today. And why does God have to command us to not grieve the Holy Spirit? Because we're prone to do it. It's kind of like when you're a parent raising little children, one of the first things you have to teach them when we're around a stove is don't touch, right? And what do they want to do? Touch. Exactly what you tell us not to do. That's the thing we want to do. And so God's telling us, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, because we're prone to do that. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 10 and 17, God's talking about the people of Israel, but 
He's talking about us too. He says, therefore, I was angry. I was angry with this generation. And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? So who is this crowd of people? It's all the Hebrews, slaves, freed from Egypt and brought by God to the promised land, but they rebelled against God continually. And here's the wonder. Seriously. Put yourself in their sandals. You have seen God work miracles. You've seen God change the Nile River to blood. You've seen God do all these different miracles, turning day to night, rain down fire, and hail from heaven. You've seen God do all these things, including sending the angel of death who destroyed the firstborn of Egypt. And the miracle of the Passover, you put the blood of a, a lamb sacrificed for you on your doorpost over your house. You stayed in your house. The angel of death passed over you. That's where the term Passover comes from. You're safe. God saved you, and God destroyed the firstborn of Egypt. And the very next morning, you're set free as a slave. So God worked 10 miracles, set you free, and you grumble and complain. And God leads you himself. He is personally with you every day. By day, he's a pillar of cloud in a desert. Think about this. How many clouds do you see in a desert? Especially a pillar of cloud that is right there with you. And at night, there's a pillar of fire. So you literally see God in a pillar of fire in the middle of your camp every day for 40 years. And he feeds you bread from heaven every morning. Better than pancakes, folks. Literally, the food of the angels God gives you every morning. All you can eat. God's buffet every morning. No charge, folks. Do you think you might be happy about all that? Do you think you might be singing praise songs to God every morning and every afternoon and every evening? Mm, I don't know, because the Israelites didn't. They grumbled and they complained and they made idols to bow down to and they wanted to go back to Egypt. Can you imagine that? God set us free. We want to go back and be slaves. So they grieved God. Their sin caused God to grieve. We're no different. Now let's talk about that for a second. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something I know is painful, but it's real, okay? I'm not causing pain. I'm just raising a reality that is pain. Every one of you that's been a parent or are parents right now know this reality. The deepest pain of every parent is when their child chooses to do the wrong thing. And it doesn't matter if your child's two years old, 20 years old, 40 years old. When your children choose to do the wrong thing and you've warned them, you've tried to teach them, you're, when they come to you advice and you tell them and they choose to do the wrong thing, it just it breaks your heart in ways like nothing else on this planet can. So when God says he grieves, that's what he's talking about. God feels a deep, gut-wrenching pain. It tears him up. This isn't fun stuff, is it? When Jesus is standing over Jerusalem and he wept, this is what we're talking about. His children choosing to do the wrong thing. And he's crying over it. Jesus takes this absolutely seriously. And Jesus does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So when we choose to do the wrong thing, in the slightest way, we grieve him. We joke about some of our sins, and I use these little imaginary air quotes on purpose, because when we're joking about things that we know aren't right, we're committing evil. When we pretend a little white lie is no big deal, and we're breaking that commandment that says, do not lie, do you think God's in heaven laughing? 
when we do just a little bit of gossip, because it's, oh, it's really juicy, do you think God's in heaven going, oh, way to go? Do you see how we are with our tiny little sins? Every one of our tiny little sins nailed Jesus to the cross. This is part of Easter we want to ignore, that it's our sins that cause this pain for God. We want the chocolate bunnies and we want the jelly beans and the baskets and we want the cute dresses on our daughters and the hats and all the good stuff of Easter. But that sin stuff, that pain stuff, oh, let's ignore that, you know. Let's go straight to the fun stuff. If we want the transformation that God brings in Easter, we have to deal with the reality first because Jesus did. And if we're going to be his followers, this is how we're going to live. We're going to deal with reality not just the fun reality, but all the reality, including the pain, every day of our lives. If it's there, deal with it. Don't try to bury it. Don't try to ignore it. Face it. That's what God does. Will, here's a question for us. Will we become people who actually dare to grieve over sin? Will we let grief touch us? Will we embrace it as Jesus did? Jesus did not bypass the cross. He went to it voluntarily. He chose it for you and I. So the pain of Easter came first before the resurrection. Jesus didn't pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, Lord, let's just you know, bypass all this pain and stuff. Let's just go straight to the resurrection. I'll, just, I'll walk into the tomb and lay down, and you can raise me from the dead in three days. How's that? Let's just make this easy. Our problem is not just that we're sinners, but our problem is we're sinners who like the easy way. Don't, don't we all like the easy way? And God says, mm, that's not how it works. Reality is, we have to deal with all of reality, including the pain, if we're going to experience the transformation that he gives. We need to be like the man in Luke 18, verses 13 and 14. Jesus told a story about two men coming to pray to God, one who was a religious guy and one who was a notorious sinner. And the notorious sinner stood, he stood in the back of the sanctuary of the temple, and he didn't even lift his eyes to God. He didn't even dare to lift his face because he knew he was a guilty sinner. And so he's standing in the back, and he's crying, and he's beating his own chest, and he's simply saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Please be merciful to me, a sinner. And the religious guy who wore all the right clothes and knew all the right, you know, lingo, stood up in the front, and he's lifting his hands, and he's singing the praise songs like all, you know, good religious people do. And, and he knows the right things to say, and he says, oh, God, I praise you, and I thank you, and... I praise you that I'm so good. I don't sin like those other horrible sinners. You know, I, I tithe and I go to church every Sunday and I do all the right things, Lord. And Jesus looked at the crowd he's teaching and he says, who do you think God was actually touched by? Who do you think God was actually impressed with? It wasn't the religious guy up front who was full of his own self-righteousness. It was a sinner in the back who wouldn't even dare to lift his eyes. Who only wanted God's mercy. Will we be people who dare to grieve over sin? Let's take this another step for, forward in our, in our own reality. In our reality today, isn't it kind of uh, almost a social game that everybody likes to play? to complain about our government, right? And it doesn't matter who's in power. You know, it doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican. It doesn't matter. We always complain about our government. Just nobody ever says, well, yeah, we've got the greatest government. They do the best job. But we do complain about them. Isn't that kind of funny that we forget we're part of the problem? We don't complain about ourselves. We complain about the mysterious them. You know, those people in Washington or those people in the Capitol. Well, folks, we live here. 
Whose capital is it, really? It's ours. I mean, how hard would it be to drive downtown and talk to your congressman or your assemblyman? I mean, it's not even an hour's drive, folks. It's, they're right there. We can talk to them anytime we want. But we talk about them. We complain about them. We don't grieve over our sin. We just want to grumble and complain about them. We're exactly like the people of Israel. So how do we take a step forward and be a little bit more like Jesus? In Psalm 5, chapter, or chapter 5, verse 5, God says, You do hate, this is speaking about God, you do hate all who do iniquity. Iniquity is any sin. And God hates all sin. God grieves over every one of his children that choose to do wrong. The same way you as a human parent choose to grieve. You feel grief when your child chooses to do wrong. It grieves you. It grieves God. God hates sin. In John chapter 3, verse 36, we all love John 3.16. You also need to love John 3.36. For God's wrath, his anger, remains on the unbeliever. Every person who chooses to live their life moment by moment, without trusting God, without loving God, and without obeying God. So if that's how you choose to live your life, not trusting and not obeying and not loving God, you're an unbeliever. Even if you're religious, you can be religious. You can be at church every Sunday. That doesn't make you a trusting, loving, obeying believer. You know, we joke about this, but you know, just because you go into your garage doesn't make you a car. Just because you show up in a sanctuary doesn't make you a follower of Jesus. You have to trust him and love him and obey him. And God's wrath remains on all who don't trust and love and obey. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. But the face of Yahweh is against those who do evil. There's one place on this earth I never want to go, never want to be there. That's the place where God's against me. That's called losing big time. You don't beat God. You know what it's like? How many of you have seen, remember your history? Those of you who are old enough to remember history. Remember Tiananmen Square in China? When the, the Chinese wanted a democracy movement and they, they had thousands of people who went to Tiananmen Square? Thank you. And this is the perfect slide. See the one tiny little person in front of the tank? Do you think that one tiny little person is going to stop that tank? Nope. There was a bloodbath. Hundreds of people were killed in Tiananmen Square. Now, I'm not saying China is God, but in the parable I'm sharing, when God's face is against you, you stand about as much chance as that one person against those four tanks. Does that kind of give, it, give you a graphic image of what it's like to be when God's face is against you? And, and who is that person? Let's remind ourselves of who that person is. Who's, who's God against? Oh, all those who do evil. You might say, any sin. God does not make excuses for any sin. He doesn't make excuses for little white lies or just a tiny bit of juicy gossip or a little bit of worry, which is not trusting God. There's no such thing as an innocent sin. Will we be people who grieve over sin like God does? Because if we will, if we will embrace that grief, if we will grieve like Jesus did as he wept over Jerusalem, if we'll become his followers to that passionate degree, then we will live, we will experience the transformation that Jesus gives. We'll experience 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. And all Christians go, amen. But do you realize what that godly sorrow means? That means embracing grief over sin. And here's our mistake. We tend to think that that verse is talking about worldly people who 
come to Jesus at places like Billy Graham Crusades and pray a prayer and walk down the aisle and, you know, raise their hand and do all that stuff. And, and then, you know, then that's their repentance. And then they go on and, well, they're done repenting. You know, I prayed the prayer. I don't have to repent anymore. Really? I'll tell you a little story about myself. I have no sense of direction. I really don't. When I go backpacking, I take two compasses and three maps. I have no sense of direction. I can drive down the same road a thousand times and still turn the wrong direction. I can get lost going to my own house. I've done it. And people joke about it. It's not funny. I mean, I recognize I have no sense of direction. You can ask my wife after the service, does, does he really have no sense of direction? Because how many times have you, I'll just put her on the spot. How many times have we been driving somewhere and you'll look at me like, what are you doing? And I'll look, I don't know, what? Because I have suddenly missed our turn and wasn't even aware of it. And she goes, why'd you do that? I go, I don't know why I did that. I've got no sense of direction. And she still doesn't believe me. She goes, hey, you do too. No, I really don't. Why am I bringing this up? Repentance is changing thinking and changing behavior. It's changing direction. So when I recognize I missed the turn, which I do frequently, I turn around. I don't keep going in the same direction, which is wrong. If we're trying to get to Roseville, I don't want to be on the I-5 going to Lodi. Right? Common sense? So if you recognize in your thinking and behavior, you're suddenly going to Lodi when God's telling you to go to Roseville, whatever that might be in your sin, right? You recognize, wait a minute, this thinking is wrong. It's not following Jesus. This is not the mind of Christ. And my behavior at this moment is not following Christ. In whatever way you're doing it, you repent. You change the thinking. You change the behavior. And you start going the direction of Jesus. If you've been a Christian 80 years, you can be one degree off. That's called sin. And you need to repent. It's a good thing. So this is a daily lifestyle for every believer of Jesus. Repentance means every moment you're asking for the mind of Christ. And every moment you are loving and trusting and obeying Jesus to follow him in his direction, in his leading. Every moment. So you could repent 80 times a day or, or zero because you might be with Jesus, going the right direction, trusting, loving, and obeying every moment of the day. You might not need to repent today. Praise God. And you might not need to repent tomorrow. Praise God. But I guarantee you, some point this, some, this coming week, I'm going to be driving. I'm going to miss a turn. I'm going to need to repent, which means changing direction. All of us need to continue following Jesus with love and trust and obedience. Amen? And so that means that from time to time, we currently repent, not just in the past, but in the present. So godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, the right direction with Jesus, being with him. That's a good thing, amen? This is where we experience the new life God has for us. In Ezekiel 18, verse 23 and verses 30 through 32, we see something that is foundational to God. People talk about God in the Old Testament being a God of wrath, a God of anger. Okay, God hates sin and and we see that in the Old Testament. God hates sin in the New Testament too, folks. That's why Jesus died on the cross. God doesn't like sin. He hates it. But we see in Ezekiel 18 that God literally says, I desire to not punish sinners. I want them to repent and live with me. So God wants repentance. Old Testament, God, want re God wants repentance. New Testament, God hasn't changed. He loves people in the Old Testament. He loves people in the New Testament. God is the same. God wants sinners to repent and live, not continue in their sin and die. God doesn't want anybody going to hell. God wants everybody in heaven. And everybody has a choice. You can choose to follow Jesus, or you can choose to reject him. But God's desire is repent and live with God. That's what God wants. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, 
Jesus is the propitiation for our sin. Propitiation is a technical theological word that was used by God on purpose. It's a Greek word in the New Testament, and it is powerful. And here's what it means. Propitiation is the satisfaction, the payment of God's wrath. Jesus dying on the cross satisfied God's wrath against sin. Emotionally, this is very powerful. God does not cover up sin. God doesn't wink at you and go, it's okay. You can sin a little bit tomorrow. I'll just ignore it. Jesus died on the cross to pay for every sin of every sinner for all time. God takes it very seriously. So he is literally the satisfaction of God's anger and God's wrath against every evil we have ever done. That's a beautiful thing. Folks, as a follower of Jesus, you will never suffer God's wrath. Amen? God's never going to burn you up. He's never going to you know, throw down a fire from heaven to burn you up because you sin one more time. As a follower of Christ, all of God's anger against sin has been paid in full on the cross. So God's not mad at you. Do you hear that? God looks at you with love because you've been covered by the blood of Christ if you have faith in Jesus. If you're living by trust and love and obedience in Jesus, God looks at you and he sees only the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't see your mistakes of the past, he sees the holiness of Jesus. That's awesome. The beauty of Christ covers you. That's what God's gift to you is. And so, we live in newness of life. This is the transformation God gives. Jesus is our propitiation. In Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 11, Christ died for sinners. We go, yes, amen. And we... Former sinners are justified by his blood. We're made just. And we've received reconciliation with God. We were the evil sinners, and now we're his loving children. Big difference. That's the transformation of the cross. Without Jesus' death on the cross, we have no reconciliation with God. It's not possible. Without Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, Without his grief over sin, he would never have gone to the cross. God cares for every person on this planet too much to leave them in their sin and death. So here's the question. Will you let godly grief move you to action? Embrace grief over sin. Embrace the pain of all the evil this world is currently doing. Embrace it, feel it, let the tears run down your cheeks, and let that grief move you to godly action as a follower of Christ. I'll give you one concrete thing you can do, a very simple thing you can do. We have cards, beautiful cards, that you can hand to your neighbors. You can put them in their doors. You can just hand them to all your neighbors and invite them to come worship Jesus this Easter. That's a simple thing, isn't it? I mean, just walk to 10 houses and hand out these postcards. That's pretty simple. Probably wouldn't take you 20 minutes. Will you? See, that's the question. Will we let God move us to action to draw people to Jesus? Most of us are pretty busy. Isn't that true? And in our day-to-day -day life, we can forget to do even simple things. And, I, you know, yesterday I was going to call my mom all day. Thought to call my mom? Well, you know, I'll do it next day. I'll do it in five minutes. And before I knew it, it was like 11 o'clock at night, and I still hadn't called my mom. All I wanted to do was invite her to dinner tonight. Now, I know how easy it is to get busy and forget to do something. So I want to invite you, when you leave here today, talk to God and ask him to help you embrace 
the pain of the grief over sin. Not say five minutes from now, but do it today. And then ask God to help you, to move you to action so that you will not procrastinate, but you will actually invite your neighbors, the people you know, to come worship Jesus. Amen? Cards are in the back on both sides by both doors. You can take a few of them. Take 20, take 10, take 5. But let God's grief move you to actions that will transform people's lives in the power of Jesus. Amen? You stand, we'll have our closing prayer. Father, I pray for us that you will take us from this place empowered by your spirit and that your word will stay in our hearts and minds so that we will not forget that you wept over Jerusalem and you are still weeping over our sin because you're our heavenly father. You, God, love us, every person on this planet. So, Lord, may we be moved to grief over sin. May we no longer joke about it. May we no longer talk about those other people somewhere else who are sinning. But, Lord, may we realize that it's here in my own heart. It's here in my own home. It's here in my own work. It's here in my own neighborhood. Lord, make me grieve like you grieve. That I will be moved to action as you, Jesus, were moved to action. That you will use every one of us as your children, as your royal priests, to do your work here in Sacramento. Lord, fill us with your spirit, guide us with your spirit, and help us to grieve over sin and act in the power of the resurrection of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you.